Red Hot Comic Book Movie News. Defenders of the Earth. Defenders. The Weekly Planet. The Weekly Planet. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of The Weekly Planet, where we talk movies and comics and TV shows. My name is James, also known as Mr. Sunday. With me, as always, is a very jazzy Nick Mason. I'm so jazzy. It's true. That's all I had. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I didn't yeah. have like a cool extended riff to go on. No. Oh, well, what are we? What are we doing then? I just, you, no one's ever described me as jazzy. Before. You were doing little jazzy moves though. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. You don't want me to call you jazzy anymore? No, keep s- calling me jazzy. No, you don't seem very jazzy. I retract it. <laughs> if keep- you're not feeling jazzy mm. and you don't, and then I don't think you should be jazzy anymore. Okay. All right. I'm taking it back. All I'm saying is you could keep calling. You know they say fake it till you make it. Yeah. I think I could. If you kept calling me jazzy, I think I'd grow into a jazzy persona. Jazzy perhaps. till you get a razzy. Good. Yep. Good. <laughs> is that anything? I'm enjoying this. Yes. This is good. <laughs> Are it's you? Good. You're trying out new things. I'm liking it. No, don't put this on me. <laughs> you said jazz. I no, I did say jazzy. <laughs> yep. There it is. There okay. It is. I just figured it out. Yep. I started this, didn't I? You started this whole thing. Yes. Hello. <laughs> We, we shan't be starting again. No. We've got not enough time and too much news. That's true, because we're going to be talking about Dungeons and Dragons Honor Among Thieves mm-hmm. this week. Yes. Which is a very exciting movie to be talking about, I feel, Mason. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, we also have to address the situation with Jonathan Majors, which we'll do up top. That'll we don't be, have to, but people will ask us. That'll be fun. It'll be yep. good to talk about. I uh, also want to talk about Clayface in, in Batman, maybe. Question mark. And other things. Mm. Uh, the box office uh, result of Ant-Man 3. And is then, that what we're calling it? The box office result. The box office result. You've got some other bits of news I to throw a little, in couple of little bits to of pepper news. in. And, mm-hmm. of course, I do want to talk about, I've done an extensive breakdown of the firing of Ike Perlmutter. <laughs> if you don't know who that is. The Dark Prince <laughs> of Marvel. <laughs> You're going to enjoy it. World's meanest man, probably. <laughs> Never seen him speak. Uh, don't know anything about him, but he seems mean. Yeah, he does seem mean, doesn't yeah. he? Yeah, no, I've got all of that uh, ready to go. There's time codes if you want to jump to anything mm. in particular. Anyways. Jonathan Majors, Mason. Uh, yep. So this happened, I think, just as we were recording last week. It happened we were, about one hour before we, did, we were recording last week. Yeah. And we thought, we don't know enough about this situation. I think we still don't know enough Absolutely. about the situation, but there have been some updates. Yeah. And like you said, we still don't know. But what was reported was that he apparently assaulted his girlfriend. And soon after that, uh, his lawyers and people came out and denied it and said they have evidence to prove plus witness statements that that this that this, mm. that this didn't happen, plus his girlfriend put in a retraction. Yes. Right, and that seemed to be the end of it, I guess. Mm, uh, sure, sure, sure. Though it's not always in, in situations, uh, you know, mm. things can just be bad all around. Yeah. And then Major's lawyer released some text messages. Between, between Jonathan the Major's and his girlfriend, yeah. And they're, they're very strange. And, and I've, I've seen people say, oh, this exonerates him. I don't, I don't think, think so. it does. Yeah. And again, I think it's really a case of this is just ongoing and awful and we don't have all the information here mm. to, you know. Yeah, look, we'll be, I think we'll mostly be staying off this. But yeah. one of the texts from the girl, the girlfriend. Uh, I can't believe they released those either. Like yeah. it's not, <laughs> I don't think that was a very savvy move. I, she says, I told them it was my fault for trying to grab your phone. Yeah. And the, the accusation is like strangulation. So yeah. I'm like, I don't, I don't know what everybody else's world is like, but I don't think you should strangle somebody for trying to grab your phone. No, I agree. This, this sound, I mean, again, this sounds like somebody in a very bad situation who's sort of Stockholm syndrome in a yeah. way. So. But again, we don't have all the information. We don't have all the information. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know people have asked, like, what does this mean for the MCU? I mean, who, who cares? Yeah, like, I think, them, you know, uh, this clearly needs to be, you know, addressed and they'll recast him or they won't. It doesn't really matter. Like, there's a, there's, there's a million Kangs. Like, who, who cares? Yeah. It's, it's really not. That's not really the big deal about out mm. of all of this. So, yeah, great. Looking mm. forward to more of this information coming Me out, Mason. Me too. Love it. Now let's Brightens do- our week. It really does. Now, Mason, Dr. Sleep filmmaker Mike Flanagan has pitched a feature version of Clayface over at the studio. Wait, what does this mean? Uh, several sources have told Deadline. However, no word on green light yet, and the studio have, but the studio has not said no. Uh, Mike Flanagan has come out and said, Ari Clayface, the news today is entirely speculative. When or if something like that ever becomes real, I promise I'll tell you guys, smiley face. So there's that element of the Clayface story. Uh-huh, but is uh-huh. there not a second element, Mason? Oh, uh, maybe he's in the Batman. Maybe he's in the Batman. Maybe he's in the movie. Well, not the, the Batman. Batman because that movie already came out. I mean, oh, the, he can be anybody. So maybe that's true. Maybe he was in the Batman the whole time. Exactly. Uh, but he might be in the Batman part two. Yeah, that's exciting. So 
Apparently, this pitch from Mike Flanagan, if it's real, wasn't pitched as part of the Batman 2, which he also might be appearing in separately. And other sources are saying that the script is constantly changing and that Clayface is a big addition to Matt Reeves's The Batman 2. So we don't know whether or not either of these things are true and if they are true, whether they are connected. And also, if any of this is true, what version of Clayface is this? I mean, that's that's our realm of rampant speculation. Here we go. So... The one, I mean, the, the one that people probably know that is probably most prominent is the one that's in Harley Quinn, the animated series, yeah. if I had to guess. Um, it was a sort of, he's a, a sort of a very theatrical kind of, uh, mm. uh, but but he's, you know, he's 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 got, you know, sci-fi clay powers. Yeah. But th- there's, in the comic books, there's been a bunch of different clay faces. And so the question becomes, is Matt Reeves' Batman universe going to become... Yeah kind of supernatural or sci-fi fantasy or is he going to be a more of a mundane clay face so the first yeah. clay face initially was just a man named basil carlo who was like a over the hill actor mm-hmm. who wore a sort of clay like mask and committed a bunch of murders and then subsequent- he could be anybody to an extent yeah <laughs> and subsequent clay faces have had shape-shifting powers and yeah. and sort of the, the the second one could you know become this this clay creature who could replicate anybody's features and you couldn't kill him because you know bullets and what have you would just pass through his clay like body. He's also and, in the Batman animated series. There's a yes, that's there's right. One really great episode yeah. where he appears. There's, yeah, I'm sure there are others. But. And there's a there's a lady version of Clayface who can not only transform into anyone but gain their powers if they have powers. Ooh. Uh, and then Basil Carlo gained Clayface powers. He gained a combination of the the, the next to Clayface's powers. Yep. And there's a guy who has like like a lava touch and he has to wear like a container I've suit. I've got the lava the touch. Everything, Everything I, I touch, it turns, turns to lava. Exactly. Ding. Yeah, that's the one. Uh, so is it one of those or is it a, an, an alternate option? Or none. Is he a guy who maybe he's got like, maybe he doesn't turn to clay specifically, but maybe he has like malle- a malleable face. Yeah. That kind of thing. Like he's not, he's not going to fight like a big clay monster like we saw in like the Arkham games. Yeah, or... yeah, but maybe he can. And, you know, obviously there's, um there is uh, in the in the comic books, there's a character called Hush mm. who has, sur- in, in uh, he's surgically altered himself to look like Bruce Wayne. Yeah. So maybe it could be a combination of those two. Maybe, you know, maybe yeah. he's fighting a version of himself. Maybe it's – because it, I think it would also be too early to introduce a character like Hush. Yes. Because there's a lot of backstory to that and, character. And Bruce Wayne has to become more of kind of like a socialite kind yes. of because that factors into the story and he's not quite mm. there yet, this particular version. What would your guess be in terms of what this – I Look, I mean, it looks like a more gritty, realistic kind of the Dark Knight-esque kind of mm. world. So like, I'm thinking like it will lean towards that. But yes. I think there was a similar thing with Batman Begins. There was a time before that second movie came out where we didn't really know what direction these movies were going to go in. It was yeah. such early days Batman and there was like hallucinogen gas and all this kind of things where it could have potentially blown out into a big sci-fi world. Yeah. And I think we're in the same position here. I kind of want the clay, gross clay man. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, I don't know though. What do you think? I think I'm gonna I'm gonna guess very malleable man. Mm. I'm gonna <laughs> guess like I'm. It's very malleable man. <laughs> That's right. Look how malleable he is. <laughs> yes. Give me your money, or I'll become more malleable than you can possibly imagine. <laughs> I think it's gonna be probably. Okay, here's my guess. It's Basil Carlo. He's some sort of actor at the end of his career or something Theater like. He's a nerd, and he maybe he. Maybe he gains. Maybe he's he's had this ability, or maybe he gains an ability to. He wants to become more youthful, and it's kind of a. But then it turns out he can push his. Oh my fate. god! It's, it's the opposite of the movie Catwoman, where you want to become more. That's youthful, right. But you turn yeah, into yeah. a porcelain person. That's right. I think he's going to be. In his, he's going to be a. Yeah, just like a sort of like shape clicking. Shift. Yeah, like he can move the bones and and flesh in his face and that sort of stuff. That's cool. It is cool. And he'll have a big knife. Yeah. And a, seri- a series of wigs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. All right, cool. Yeah. Well, I don't disagree. Because I think if he's just a guy in a mask, that's just the Riddler again. Because I know they've also talked about, and maybe it's just more rumour, that maybe they'll do like a Mr. Freeze or whatever. Mm. And But Mr. Freeze is, again, it's like a level below in terms of like a weird clay man. Yeah. You know, like you could be like, I don't know, he's got a cryo disease and he has to be in a suit. Yeah. It's not mm. as... I think this universe is is sort of more heightened than the the uh, Nolan definitely. Batman. So I yeah. think if any of these universes are going to have a more sci-fi bent to them, yeah. 
I even like I, I I've said before. I think there was the capacity for there to be a Superman in the Nolan universe, just like a golden age. Definitely, Superman. and I think they could probably do it in this I think as well. They even looked into that. I think the idea was initially that they went to Christian and Bale, and it was like, no, I don't, no, no, no. <laughs> Didn't I, I know. break my knee in that movie or something? Mm, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, fi- I don't care if I fixed it. I don't want to do it. I've got enough money and I already made a Terminator movie. That's true. Yeah. Great stuff, Mason. Mm-hmm. Variety reporting that Ant-Man 3 will not be breaking even. Uh-oh. It's apparently going to reach maybe $500 million at the worldwide box office, which you think would be good mm-hmm. for a movie that didn't apparently need $600 million to break even. Mm, half a billy, you'd go, that's yeah. pretty good. It's pretty good. I mean, if this movie cost $10 million, this is the biggest <laughs> thing that ever happened. That's right. But it didn't. It cost mm. uh, $600 million to break even is... So much for an Ant-Man movie. It's also going to come in under both of the previous Ant-Man movies, mm. which is, I mean, that's not good news either. You yeah. Know? Mm. It is It is wild, isn't it? Did you see the trailer for Asteroid City? Uh, the new Wes Anderson? No, I, I saw the, the thumbnail and okay, I went, right. oh, yeah. yeah. What does it look like? Really? I mean, very Wes Anderson-y. People hate that, though, sometimes. They go, look at this, it looks like a Wes Anderson movie. <laughs> yeah. I, hate, I hate it when every five years this guy comes out with another movie that I don't have to watch if I don't want to. I hate that. This guy sucks. It looks fun. And I like what, his movies. But, but that, you got me thinking because an Ant-Man movie evidently costs $250 million. Wes Anderson movies don't cost that, and yet the cast is insane. Yeah. Like, there's... if. Do you think there is something to, to like, a studio like Disney going to actors and the actors are the people who manage them know that they can push them for, like, $10 billion? Oh, yeah, definitely. But if you do, like, a Wes Anderson, you're like, I don't know, I'll take a pay cut and... I think I they know. just like working with him. Yeah, exactly. Look, listen, listen and to... sit on a real set. <laughs> this this is the cast list for Asteroid City. Jason Schwartzman, mm-hmm. obviously. Shock, what? Yeah, really? Right. But then Scarlett Johansson, Tom Hanks, Jeffrey Wright, Tilda Swinton, Brian Cranston, Ed Norton, Adrian Brody, Liev Schreiber, Hope Davis, Stephen Park, Rupert Friend, Maya Hawke, Steve Carell, Matt Dillon, Hong Chow, Willem Dafoe, Margot Robbie, Tony Revolori, Jake Ryan, and Jeff Goldblum. My goodness. That's like $200 million worth of casting. Yeah, absolutely. 100, I mean, Scarlett Johansson alone yeah, well, is, yeah. would, would be the entire budget of one of these movies. Like, where's Anderson movies like 20 million bucks? Yeah. But clearly people just like working with them. You know, it's one for me, one for you kind of situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you, so, do a, you do a big black widow and you do one of these. And You do a ghost in the shell, you do one of these. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah, but like the idea that, and again, but, but I'm, uh, that's what I'm thinking because like uh, these movies, you know, they're very Wes Anderson-y, but they all look great. And it's just like yeah. the fact that you're spending $250 million on Ant-Man and the Wasp, and it, you know, it's pretty good. Mm. Weird, isn't it? It is weird. Just make you, it make you think. He's also making a um, the wonderful story of Henry Sugar story, which is my favorite Roald Dahl short story, and I think story oh. in general about a man who learns to look through cards to win at gambling. Oh, that's right. Yeah, it's a great story if you haven't read it. Uh, but Roald Dahl also has a complicated history. <laughs> Let me just preface that, mm-hmm. preface by saying that. But uh, yeah, maybe he learns a lesson or whatever. Whoa, yeah, you know, anyway. Roald Dahl. Do you think he learns a lesson? I might have. Great. I think it was, you know, he was probably, I mean, he was. He was very revolutionary and forward thinking for his day. But, you know, it's now the modern day. And, you yeah. know, you got to look at through things through a certain lens, Mason. Mm-hmm. Hey, here's one bit of news, James. Oh, my God, for this show? Yeah, for this show. Let's go. I'll just be you in your life. All right. I'm saving that for later. Um, so Quentin Tarantino, we mentioned last, uh, mm. in weeks past, he had he's got a movie coming out called The Movie Critic, and and you know he's got a sort of a, a present day love affair with old Hollywood, nineteen sixties Hollywood, etc. And so they're like, okay, who's a prominent movie critic? It could be about it could be about uh, Pauline Kael. Oh yes, but it turns out it's not. He's he's confirmed it's not about Pauline. Oh, who's Kael. it about? He hasn't said. Is it about? It's about the us. nostalgia critic. That's right. That's oh, right. God. That's right. He's going to blow the budget on t-shirts and ties. <laughs> um, but it's 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 not about Pauline Kael, but the one piece of news here that I thought was interesting is it's set in 1977. What came out in 1977, James? Drugs. Yeah, drugs. <laughs> it's just going to be about drugs. That was the introduction of drugs, wasn't that's it? That's right. The first drugs came out. Yeah, then. that's yeah. cool. Uh, that's well, Quaaludes. So is this a shot at Star Wars? I think it might and, be. And a shot the blockbuster era. I think it might making. be. Yeah. While he has had run-ins with that's what I'm saying. Disney, yeah. yeah. Did we t- we talked about this it's last very, week. Like it's not like you went. Oh, it's set in the 70s, I guess, or whatever. But yeah. it's 1977. <laughs> very, very pointedly, mm. I think. I think it's. I think this is going to be a shot at Star Wars and the blockbuster industry. But I also and, think it's interesting because he. From memory, he likes Star Wars because Star Wars, original Star Wars, Star Wars 1, yeah, yeah. Uh, working title was Blue Harvest. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, go on. Like that movie 
I mean, I know it was the biggest movie of the time it became that, but it was this really weird, underground, unusual movie That's true. that happened to become the biggest franchise in the world. Yeah. So I think he, from that perspective, he liked it, but uh-huh. then in, ter- in terms of like what it has become now, yeah. he obviously does not because they're Disney are pushing his movie off cinema screens. And pushing every movie off cinema screens. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, well, that is very interesting. I did not know that. I think I think that's what it's going to be. So Should they get the critic uh, from that animated show, The Critic, whatever his name is? Yeah. <laughs> What's his name again? Well, it's John Lovitz. Yeah. But it stinks. The... Yeah, it stinks. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah, get... or, <laughs> mate, uh, yeah, I mean. I... Do you think it's going to be like a fictional critic, do you? Or like an amalgamation of. I think it might be. Do you yeah. think he's going to run into the theatre and machine gun George Lucas? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> like the end of Inglorious Bastards? Maybe. And save cinema? Or he gets machine gunned, you know? Sure, yeah. 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 Well, I'm interested to see how that's going to turn out. What if it's what if his, it's his, the character's name Siskel Ebert? <laughs> he's just a he's just a mutated amalgamation of those two. Oh, I love that. Mm. Do you have any more one bits of news, Mason? Not currently, no. Well, then let's talk about some more Disney stuff. Okay. This is actually sad news. Uh, um, for a, for for it's sad news for the seven thousand staff members of Disney who are affected by the layoffs right. that are currently happening worldwide. But the silver lining of that is it's very sad news for one particular man mm-hmm. who has been caught <laughs> in, these, in, the, in, in the layoffs. So that is one Ike Perlmutter. Yes. Now, a little bit of background on who this guy is. Please. Uh, you may already know, but I've unearthed some stuff. I did, I did, a pretty, I did like a couple hours of a deep dive on this guy yesterday to, to, to figure, you know, to find some more information to figure this mm. out. So here's a billionaire businessman, okay. uh, self-made. So I don't believe billionaires can be self-made because their money is obviously built off the back of its exploitation. Let's not get okay, into it, Mason. Okay, Stalin. I okay, know. Okay, Joseph uh, he Stalin. He says from an iPhone, etc. <laughs> I know, but I don't believe that that can be done without, like, without crushing people on the way up. Okay, Bernie Sanders. <laughs> Anyways, he's also notoriously frugal and weird. He is known for being reclusive. There's a couple of very famous photos of him. There's this one of him with Trump. Do you hear that? Mm, That weird noise. That weird noise that plays when you look at that photo. That's not edited in. That's the noise that that photo makes. Google it uh, if you don't believe me. Uh, So he acquired Marvel in 1998 via a toy company that he controls. Was it Toy Biz? It was something like that, yeah. And... Marvel was worth nothing then, basically. Yeah. He got it for pennies on the dime, Mason, mm. which is definitely why he bought it. Probably swapped it for some filing cabinets or something like that. Mm. They're like, exactly. I'll give you some new desks if you, uh, <laughs> you agree to this purchase. So a little over a decade later, he helped orchestrate the sale of Marvel to Disney. Mm. Uh, that sale led by Iger was $4 billion, yeah. which obviously he benefited from. He took it. Immensely, that son Mason. of a bitch. He did, yeah. And Disney agreed to continue employing him as a chairman of Marvel. Of Mar of Marvel. Of Marvel. I thought sure he has a lot of Marvel. Or maybe he doesn't. I'll talk about it. Okay. Of Marvel. He was a chairman. So also he rubbed people like the wrong way constantly. There's a number of these he's a few of the situations which have been reported on about this man over the years. He said we can switch out Terrence Howard for Don Cheadle in the Iron Man movies. Because no one will notice. Because no one will notice. Uh because it was he was a notorious cost cutter. And the quote from him was, black people look the same. His words, Mason. Wow. Uh, On a rare visit to Hollywood for the 2008 premiere of Iron Man, he attended in disguise. Uh, Someone quoted as saying, he walked right past me and I had no idea it was him. (laughs) He's got to be sworn by the press. Uh, Yeah, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, Abby Arad said this about him, notorious Spider-Man ruiner, and also brought Spider-Man to the big screen. Um, he used to do this thing in our office that people would laugh at. He spoke to the Financial Times about this in 2009. If there was some used paper clips or a memo lying around, he would rip it into eight pieces and then have a new memo pad. Apparently he would also... What? Yeah. What does that mean? He would just like use scraps to make new memo pads oh, or whatever. Oh, right, yeah. okay. Like fishing stuff out of bins and stuff, which I'm not against recycling and whatever. Sure, I mean, okay. you should. I mean, it's yeah, good yeah, to make yeah. use of it, but what are you doing? Um... <laughs> 
He would also he probably got his old bit of soap and he squished it onto the new bit of soap. He in definitely the did. I mean, yeah. yeah, that's fine. Also, isn't it? But he would fish paper clips and worn down pencils out of the trash for reuse. Apparently, Mr. Perlmutter and his wife enjoyed getting a Saturday lunch of a hot dog, a yogurt, and a diet coke for three dollars and three cents at the local Costco supermarket in Florida. But grouse to colleagues that the same lunch cost pennies more at the same store near the couple's home in New- in the New York area. <laughs> no. This is also. Also recently, I just want to point yeah, out right. this isn't in the fucking fifties. Now, okay? did 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 they did they get their own hot dog and yogurt, or did they share a hot dog and yogurt? It's like <laughs> a a half qu- a hot dog and half a yogurt each. Great question, mm. Mason. Uh, he was also accused of shaping veterans' affairs under the Trump administration because they're buddies, right? And in doing so, it ended up benefiting himself and his associates. Oh, so you know, big veterans guy. Apparently, yep. he was also a veteran himself, I believe, as well. Um, though well, then he, we must salute him. <laughs> okay, the, Stalin. Though Stan Lee said this of him once. Okay, Storm and Norman <laughs> Schwarzkopf. <laughs> he said, I have the greatest respect for him. He doesn't look for publicity and he keeps to himself. Marvel is run so beautifully. Ike is uh, to a large part responsible for that. So there's a little bit of background. Mm-hmm. Um, Kevin Feige was reportedly sick of reporting to him. Uh-huh. And in 2005, they, it came to an impasse. Mm. He, I believe one of the situations was that he wanted to bring Robert Downey Jr. into Civil War. Uh-huh. And Ike Perlmutter was like, absolutely not. That dude, like it'll cost us $20 million. You needed him at that point. It, uh-huh. was, it yeah, was a yeah. good decision to do it, right? And so Bob Iger apparently has said this in his book, who now is back to run Disney, uh-huh. that Perlmutter wanted to fire Kevin Feige in 2015. And so what... Your dad, Bob Iger, did was Go on. it was officially your dad. This is a good running joke. Good that we bit, do. such a good <laughs> bit. Is that he pushed him aside so Kevin Feige didn't have to report to him anymore, and okay. he was and Ike Perlmutter was put in front, put in charge of the television division. So of this Marvel. sounds to me a story about um, Bob Iger and Kevin Feige stabbing a man in the back. This is what this is. <laughs> this is sounding a veteran, Mason. This is sounding a hot dog enjoyer. This is sounding bad for those guys and pretty good for old Ike Perlmutter. Let me tell you. Uh, so then as a result of that, like, that's why we got the Inhumans. There was initially supposed to be an Inhumans movie. That was because Ike Perlmutter was pushing for that because they couldn't get the X-Men rights back at that's the time. Right. That is one of the very few Marvel movies that didn't happen, yeah. and I think it's because Kevin Feige was like, well, now that I don't have to do this movie, I'm not going to. <laughs> that's why we got that weird Inhumans show. I remember uh, it. And now it also more recently he's actually been removed from even the television division. Whoa. And he was then in charge of comic books. I should say until recently again, which now comics apparently brings in Marvel comics about $60 million a year, which is, you know, good. But also peanuts. But also peanuts compared to like the billions that the TV, like streaming Mm. and movies bring in. Anyways, Mr. Perlmutter more recently continued to try and influence movies making decisions after being forced out as CEO of Marvel. So even then he was still trying to get his little grubby paws on it, Mason. Mm. And according to people familiar with the matter, as recently as October, he sent emails to top Disney executives seeking financial information about the Marvel movies and questioning the studio's wisdom in greenlighting big budget titles such as last year's Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. I also understand that when you look at a movie like Ant-Man, obviously mm-hmm. that is over-budgeted. I don't think a movie like Doctor Strange is, though. I think, I mean, that movie nearly made a billion dollars. I think it's that true. was a good financial decision. But can you, you can say that in, in, in hindsight. Yeah. Could you have said that ahead of time? For Doctor Strange, I think so, yeah. yeah. They did multiverse <laughs> stuff and whatever. And you're probably right with Ant-Man. Like, being yeah. like a $200 million Ant-Man movie. So is much. So much, yeah. Yeah. Uh, apparently, I though. I think you should go really small and hide in somebody's car or something and jump out and be like, Boo! <laughs> You wouldn't have to do effects. You could just have Paul Rudd sit in your back seat and <laughs> jump right. up. you like, boo. boo. Give me $10 million. Right. <laughs> just a fun little heist with like, Ant-Man hiding in your car, you know? <laughs> That's That's all you right. need. Exactly. That's all you need. You could be like, I was just in the quantum realm. Yep. It's where I'm so small. But I'm back. I'm back, though. And I'm regular size. And let me tell you, it wasn't that interesting, so I'm glad I'm in this 1986 Toyota Corolla. <laughs> Tell you that much. Well, where you're doing a small crime, and I'm stopping you from doing a small crime. So, That's what it's all about, James. I agree. He was told on Wednesday that Disney is folding his Marvel Entertainment unit into other parts of the company, and that he would be let go. Apparently, this was a long time coming. Oh. Like they wanted to do this for a while, yeah. and the final straw was that he was trying to get his friend and fellow business billionaire activist, which I think is cool, by the way. Oh yeah, uh, in, investor Nelson Peltz, who's actually the grandfather of Nicola Peltz from. One of the Transformers movies, oh. the underage card situation. Oh yeah, that's right. her. Okay, that's Hollywood, baby. 
Um, <laughs> uh, he was trying to get his friend uh, Nelson Peltz on board on the board at Disney so that they could push significant changes to Disney's governance and operations, including cost cutting. That's a big thing this week. I, I was going to include it in one bit of news, but I didn't understand it. Because there's too much going on, There's right? too much going on. It's something to do with the 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 – the government of Florida wants to take control of some of Disney's operations, yes. but Disney's trapped them in some sort of contractual yeah. loophole where they've they've said that Florida can't con- take control over any of these particular operations until 21 years after the death of the last survivor of the descendants of King Charles III, King of England. <laughs> so, so when's that? Like 2053 Right. Yeah. Yeah, here's the thing about like... Corporate- Which is a weird thing that like apparently like th- this seems like a really obvious thing that a lawyer should have picked up on and been like... Well, I, I think, like, the idea of Florida doing that and Ron DeSantis specifically, hate to get to political, Mason, mm-hmm. he's just throwing that shit out there to gain points in, like, this culture war without addressing any, like, actual systemic issues. Ooh. Like, the idea that, like, a corporation can dictate a government, it's ridiculous, but that is what happens. Yeah. Most, most governments in the world operate at the behest of corporations, and this is an example of... Just that happening. Makes you think, doesn't it? But I think I think he knew that though. I think it was literally just to be like, we're gonna stop Disney saying gay or whatever. Mm. And that he knows that they're not really gonna do it. And this just happened. Like, whatever. (laughs) Anyway. (laughs) Anyway, we've covered that, I think, to everyone's satisfaction. (laughs) Yeah. But apparently he uh in order to get this guy on the board, Ike Pelmutter was reaching out to Disney executives. Uh he did it six times since July. And then in February when it didn't happen, he was actually... Six times the charm, he said. That's right. But he was actually quite happy in February because he heard that they were going to be... As happy as an Ike Perlmutter could be. Well, you, this is why, though. <laughs> this is why, though, because... As happy as an Ike Perlmutter who's got half a hot dog in his gob. <laughs> He's just chomping down that Costco hot dog. It's a good... That's a good, good value stuff at a Costco. I don't know if the last Do you reckon time he'd, been t- he'd take the bigger half of the hot dog? Yeah, I think he would. Think just he slightly would. bigger. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. Uh, but he was happy in February and he kind of pulled back on this because he heard about the 7,000 jobs they were going to axe uh-huh. and how they were going to reduce spending as a result by $5.5 billion. So he was like, good, not realising that, that this affected him directly, it turns out. Surprise, number one job we're cutting is yours, Ike. <laughs> yeah. Cop that. The Wall Street- Yours is most <laughs> of the billions there, honestly, of the, of the- of the money we're saving. It's mostly your salary, actually. Exactly. The Wall Street Journal uh, was quoted as saying, this whole fight was was not, in Ike's mind, about changing the Disney board. It was mostly about changing their attitude. So as a result of this, he got fired and his services are now no longer required. And now he can go... Whatever you do, we don't need it anymore. Exactly. Honestly. So he can go, you know, live in a live in a bin and eat expired cat food or whatever weirdo fucking billionaires <laughs> to do with their times. Do with their time. So there you go. That's... James, they, they're on big super yachts. Where they live in a bin, a big golden <laughs> bin, and they eat, they eat, they do eat cat food. Yeah. I, I know. I mean, he's eighty years old as well, and I know uh, you mentioned this recently. When we covered Avatar. Like the only come up and like someone like this person gets like a billionaire is when they don't get exactly what they want. It's a slight. <laughs> it's a minor embarrassment that maybe somebody at their country club will bring up. Oh, so you don't oh, got got the boot from Marvel, did you? Yeah. <laughs> and they all leave in their Rolls Royces or whatever. Exactly. Or wheelie bins, if you're right, Bill Matter. Yeah. yeah, there you go. So, wow, what an era. And um, I don't know. I mean, he seemed to do, you know, he, he brokered some deals, and I guess that's, okay, that's, yeah. that's good, but all, yeah. all accounts, just a fucking dog of a bloke. <laughs> so there you go. Yep. Now that we've done getting so political, Mason. Oh, yes, go on. Uh, I, which everybody always enjoys. We're going to be talking about the big release of this week, Mason. Oh, a big time release. That's right. We're going to be talking about Dungeons and Dragons Honor Among Thieves. Now, with a budget of $151 million, uh, these are early box office days because we're recording this a little bit early, but it looks as if worldwide it's probably going to make about $65 million. And that's like on the conservative estimate. Okay. It's the US opening is probably going to be around $30 million, maybe a bit higher. I wouldn't be surprised if it did a little bit to much better than that though considering that the word of mouth is pretty good the rotten tomato score is good mm-hmm. i it's it's a, i i enjoyed this but what do you think the story was oh man we watched it like two weeks ago i on. know all right so uh, let's how can i do this? they were pretty confident in this that they just started showing general audiences that's true yeah, <laughs> yeah. okay so chris pine he's a bard and he's he's living in the forgotten realms realm and he's all he used to be a cool 
Uh, he was in a. He, he used he's to a have, cool spy bar. He's a cool, cool, cool spy bar. He had a, a wife and, and and daughter, and everything was cool. And then now, since then, he's hit tough times, and he <laughs> and he he stole a, a thing he shouldn't have stolen, and, have and bad stuff happened. And now he's on the outs, and it's just him and his pal Michelle Rodriguez, and yeah. they're they're like, uh, we gotta. They're in they're in prison. They go, like, we gotta we gotta bust out of this prison. We gotta get out. And we gotta do adventures. Like I'm gonna, Chris Pine's like, I'm gonna get my daughter back. Yep. And uh, and uh, um, we gotta stop the bad guys. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah, because there's bad guys and whatever. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. You know, that's the that's the movie. That's the thing. And, and they, they're like, we're gonna get, we're gonna get a team. We're gonna get an adventuring party going. You we know, do, don't we? Yeah. We gotta yeah. stop Hugh Grant. We gotta stop Hugh Grant yeah. in real life too. He's a that's menace. Right, that's right. Apparently, he was rude on red carpets or something. Oh, I, see, I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> Did you think it was rude? No, he's British. Yeah, he's exactly. Being British. Yeah. He's just being British. Come on. <laughs> he was doing a little British joke, and it seemed to me like he was increasingly trying to keep selling the joke, and they weren't getting the joke. <laughs> so, and that's like, British. I'm going to try being more British until this breaks through. <laughs> I'm going to be more and more intensely British until. They finally get this, but I don't think they ever did. Exactly. Now, this is from directors John Francis Daly and Jonathan Goldstein. They also directed the movie Game Night, which if you oh, haven't yeah. seen, is a fun little board game. It's not really a board game movie. Mm. This guy's board games in it, but it's more about an experience of These fun. These dudes are obsessed with board games. They're obsessed with board games, yeah. So John Francis Daly, of course, was in Freaks and Geeks, and there's a Dungeons oh. & Dragons-specific episode huh. in uh... – God, dude, get over it. Get over it. Stop God. it. God. There's already it. a definitive Dungeons & Dragons movie. Touch grass, dude. <laughs> God. Um, I thought, like, this was a lot of fun. Mm. And it kind of went, can we somehow make Guardians of the Galaxy? Give yes. it that vibe. It look, and it, is, it does. It is that. unmistakably Guardians of the Galaxy-esque. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, it's... But, I mean, that is just shorthand for it's a fun movie and colourful and it's got a bit of heart to it. Yes. I'm sure there was probably pre-Guardians of the Galaxy, there was a term for that. The Mummy Movies. The, was the, one was of the mummy movies. The first the mummy movie. <laughs> yes, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I think it's got a really good balance of like humor and action. And there's also the moments that need to be taken seriously are. Mm. I think there's also the, the party themselves, which I guess we can address individually, are great. And I think the use of the villains is good. I think because you've got like your big cackling kind of red wizard, mm. like demon entity. And then you've got like a foppish con man. British mm. Hugh Grant. That's and not. Th- that's not a spoiler. I think that's in the trailer. No, it's in the trailers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I think that the relationship between him and and the other characters. That's that's yeah. for spoilers. I yeah, think. absolutely. We'll talk about uh, that more then. But it's uh, yeah. I, I think that if you had, I think just one of those, I don't think it would have worked as well because you've got a slimy little threat and then a greater <laughs> threat. Yes. You uh, know. Sure. Yeah. And, yeah. I, and that's what I what I liked about it. I also think it's. Oh, maybe he wasn't a villain. Maybe he was just being British. Maybe he was just being British. <laughs> so I like Chris Pine as like the leader of the, mm. the group as well. I mean, he's, he's he's just Chris Pining about. What is he like in real life? Is he like this? Is he like dry and funny and witty and all of those That's things? That's a great question. Because he does that because he's pretty like, I don't want to say reclusive, but, mm. you know, you see him in an interview and he's just kind of like, oh, yeah. Apparently he was at some sort of panel quite recently and he was like, hey, everybody, anybody played Dungeons and Dragons? Dead silence. Nothing. <laughs> Just expecting a woo, and everybody was like, no, actually, we don't. <laughs> Did he say? We play Pathfinder. It's different. <laughs> I think him and the people. Hopefully he wasn't at a Dungeons and Dragons convention because that would have been embarrassing. Absolutely. <laughs> we do, but we refuse to acknowledge you. You're too handsome. <laughs> well, he's, all, he's also talked about how he thinks it's great. I think he's got a nephew who played, and he just oh. loves the idea of no, it. No, he doesn't. He's made, that he nephew. he's made that nephew up. Oh, really? Well, yeah. that's me, Mason. I was the nephew. Wow. Yeah. What do you think of that? You're not a real guy. That's true. <laughs> but Michelle Rodriguez also is great. I agree. And I think what they do, so there's also Sophie Lillis who's like this, what's she, like a changeling kind of? She's a, she is a tiefling druid. Thank so you. the druid is the character class. Look at this nerd. Uh, it's a, they, they commune with nature and so forth. What's the difference between a druid and a wizard? <laughs> James, that we do not have time. You've got to get out of here in like an hour. We do not have time for me to hammer in the head the obvious difference between a druid and a wizard. Is druid doing like spells and stuff and yes. a wizard's blasting with a stick? Yes. Okay. Which one can open a door, like a portal? I think they can both open a portal, but a druid would open a portal in a tree probably. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right. The druid does nature stuff. More nature stuff, okay. The, the wizards tap into a, a magical uh, element of the universe called the weave. The it's weave? It's like the force. Okay. It's like the force. And you go, 
and, and I'll I'll wave the stick and I'll say the words and then I'll, I'll use the magic to turn it into an effect or whatever. Can anybody be a wizard? No. Wait. So you have to be born mm. with a particular wizardy ability? No, I think anybody can be I know can you can use like wizard. magical items. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that... No, anybody can be a wizard. You have to have a certain intelligence level, I think, okay. in the game. Again, I haven't played Dungeons Dragons in 20 years, so yeah, yeah, I, don't yeah, know. Yeah. I don't know what the requirements are now. They've probably dropped the requirements. You can probably have a beard and tattoos now. Yeah. You know? I hope so. Yeah. Uh, Sobe Littles was great as that shape-shifting thing that you said. Justice Smith is great as the wizard. I really liked Regé Jean Page uh-huh. uh, as, like, this serious, the most serious and, like, noble man in the land. Like, mm. I think, like, he's he's not in it for as much as I think I would have liked, but I know there is, I think you even talked about this, like, there is kind of, Drax kind of vibes with him because he, yes. you know, he doesn't get sarcasm or what He takes or everything literally, it seems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think also he's portrayed as like more heroic and intelligent mm. than that. And I, I thought he was a, a really good addition. And and if you look at all those characters individually and then you look at like the action sequences, like one's shape-shifting, one's magic blasting, like <laughs> like there's sword play. The, Michelle Rodriguez does like a couple of really good like brawls in it as mm, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the... There's a moment where they're in an underground cabin or whatever and the most serious nobleman in the world or whatever has a really good, like, just sword fight in the middle yeah. of this movie that's different than, than everything yeah. else which, which is happening. Yeah. Mm. Here's a question for you, though. Go on. Do you, what did you recognise in terms of lore from this? How lore-heavy is it? Because I know there's moments where I'm like, oh, I heard Boulder's Gate. Oh, right. Oh, I, I recognise that chest with the tongue in it. <laughs> a mimic. Whatever. That's a mimic, yes. Yes, a mimic. Yes. I mean, that's a fa- that that has become a pretty common enemy in, like, fantasy lore in general. Sure. Like, if you play Dark Souls, there's often mimics and stuff mm. like that. Uh, it's lore-heavy, but it's not – they haven't done it to – if if you've never played a Dungeons & Dragons, it will not – yeah, uh, it will. It will not confuse or upset you. Okay, you can just go into this, and it's it's just like if you went into Lord of the Rings and they were like, "Oh, he's Rivendell." You don't need to know where it is specifically because I don't. Um, but do you want to open a map and have a look and go? No. Oh, they walked. No, that's how far I'll never they do that. From no, the no. Hobbit, from the Shire. but it is it is set pretty definitively in the the Forgotten Realms campaign setting. Um, so in the Forgotten Realms, if you're playing it, does it depending on the book that you use, it moves forward in time, I assume, and there are advancements in. Like a wizard might have tattoos and whatever. Do you know what I mean? Like is yeah. there a timeline that you can put yourself in is what I'm saying? There is a timeline, but I think most people probably – like there because there's like companion novels and stuff like that. Yeah. And there is a there is a time like there is a there is a version of that campaign setting in the dis set in the distant past. Right. There might be a future setting, I don't know. But yeah, I guess I mean technically you could set it your your own personal game anywhere in that timeline. Mm. But I imagine most people who play it go, it's, it's just sort of roughly Yeah. Wherever. Right here. Yeah, yeah. We're not gonna mess with canon here, are we, Mason? No, that's exactly right. Yeah, absolutely. So I don't know when this is set exactly. Although the uh Justice Smith's character is a descendant of a character called Elminster Ormar. Yeah. And he is like he is the creator of the Forgotten Realms like Avatar. In that world, like he's like he's okay. the he's the mightiest good wizard in the world, or whatever. Cool, because he's the, that's the character that he played in real life, and then he brought it into the the fiction. Oh, okay. So, so um, the actor in this, I assume, is not the actual guy. I no, assume. I don't think so. No, yeah, yeah. no. And, but and he's described as Justice Smith's character is described as the the descendant of this character, but I think Elminster's like hundreds of years old. Yeah, so it doesn't. It might not even be true. Yeah, right. Maybe it's maybe it's also not true. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But like other other than that, like there's place names, there's Baldur's Gate, there's um the Underdark. Yep. Which is where the Dark Elves live. There's Age of Empires, there's Dungeon Keeper. That's there's right. World of Warcraft. There's Roller Coaster Tycoon. <laughs> that's right. There's Sim City 2000. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um that's and you know, there's a lot of monsters common to the the, the specifically to the Dungeons and Dragons universe. Like displace of beasts and yeah, so on and so forth. So. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so there's a moment in this where I feel I feel like it does hint at things like that are going to happen. I think we actually had this conversation because we saw this movie six years ago. In that, <laughs> there's a moment at the start where you know Chris Pine is in jail with Michelle Rodriguez and they have to appeal before a court and they're waiting for this specific person to turn up, yeah, so that they can make their appeal. Ah, uh-huh. and. I guess this is a this is probably more of a spoiler. Maybe I'll you know what this is a good reveal, and I might save it for spoilers. Okay, great. But I feel like there is more information in that scene if you know who's going to walk through the door. Oh yeah, I guess you're absolutely then, right. Like, we'll like, it, yeah. Then like you knew what it was, but I yeah, yeah, have yeah. no idea what like what's going to happen. And I I think there's probably a number of moments in this. Where... But I don't think it would spoil the ending. I think as soon as the the you know as soon as the that 
particular action set piece. Or as soon as a particular character arrives on the scene, you'd be like, oh, I get it now. Yeah. I get what they're little. They're, totally, they're a couple yeah. of schemers and I get what the scheme is now. I got I got the feeling in this, and maybe I'm wrong, that there were a number of moments in this movie like that that I didn't get until like because until I saw it. Right, you know? okay, sure, It's like sure. when someone in Star Wars goes, oh, look, it's Greedo. And if you know who Greedo <laughs> is, you know that's a big deal, basically. That's right. That's he's right. back from the dead and that's he's right. looking for revenge. Yeah. What I think this also did well is that it doesn't lean into either pandering to, like, hardcore Dungeons & Dragons fans, uh-huh. which I think also people hate when they, when, they, when it's just, like, a reference-heavy, yeah, you know, right, like, right. impenetrable, uh-huh. like, just lore-heavy kind of choked kind of thing. But it also doesn't, like poke fun at it like this it's just fun moments but it's also if you like this stuff it doesn't punish you for it <laughs> no that's true i think it's poking a little bit of fun no no, i mean in a good way but not yeah. like you're an idiot for like no that's this. true because we have you know recently we watched the movie pixels oh, which exactly is like, if you like video games you suck exactly like often there's like in properties there's and it could be something like this there's like a disdain for it yes it's like when they changed deadpool in x-men origins it would that was really a case of like no, we know better than you do. Right. This is uh-huh. this is actually the cool way to do yeah. Deadpool. Uh-huh. And I think that was like the balance in this is really good. And I think also not having the reveal be that like they're people in the real world playing a Dungeons and Dragons thing. Uh-huh. I'm really glad they didn't do that. Uh-huh, sure. Because just I think that just cuts through literally everything that, that happens. If it's just like, no, it's just some story and it was about divorce. Like it was about the real world divorce <laughs> yeah, or something. Yeah, right, right, right. And I'm glad they didn't go in any of those directions. And, and that would remove the stakes, of course. Completely, yeah. yeah. Because if if the worst that could happen was some of the characters die and you just either just bring them, or you just you just rip up their character sheets or whatever and be like, <laughs> well, you got to roll a new character. Well, great, who cares? Yeah, because you'd You're have to build right. that the whole movie around like the characters in the real world and the parallels in the, you know, the fantasy world. Mm. And you'd end up with being like that episode of community with Dungeons and Dragons, which is great, by the way. I think, is there a couple of those? I can't there remember. is a couple, yeah. yeah. But that obviously works because yeah. it's the characters from community mm. playing Dungeons and but Dragons. But yeah, no, this, again, this is just, this is a fun heist adventure and the action is pretty solid, I think. And the, the you know, the, the, the party interaction is the key to this. Yes. If they're just, if, if like the first, Dungeons and Dragons movie, which again we saw recently. It's a good movie. If all the characters are insufferable yeah. and they don't like each other and, and they're not funny. <laughs> and they're not funny or interesting, then it's not gonna work. But these these characters, you know, yeah. good back and forth, and they all have, you know, they they all have um, you know, prior history with one another mm. and and they all meld together into a cool team. Into a cool, horrible team. They get bonded at one point yeah. as a big glob and they go, Ugh! Remember that bit? Yes. That's not true. It's another thing that happens. I tricked you, Mason. Oh. Um, I think also like they put twists on things that you would see in other fantasy movies. There's a moment where they come across a dragon and you're like, oh, that's a terrifying dragon, whatever. But it's this incredibly like overweight corgi shaped kind of dragon. Yeah, 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 and yeah. I think that like having an action scene where it's not just your standard kind of dragon yeah, yeah. makes it more interesting. I think he might be a notable dragon in the Dungeons and Dragons universe, but I don't know. They who do he is. name him specifically. They don't do, they? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's a fun thing. And even stuff like. This, they get like they get the portal weapon from uh, the game Portal. Yes, right? that's true. Which I believe is. Sorted. I thought that was a little bit um... the way that they when they discovered it, they're like, "Oh, this is a portal." Yeah, stick. it was. It was a very, very, very convenient uh, revelation. Yeah, they, maybe there should have been a scene earlier where they figured out what it was or whatever. But mm. but yeah, there's a moment where they really needed it, and they were just like, "Oh, we have we've got that. We've got it already." But there's a moment where they have to get inside a horse drawn carriage. And they're using the portal thing. Mm. And I think in like a more boring movie, it would have just been you zap it through the window and then you just step yep. into it. But it's like this fun little action stealth sequence. A little bit Ocean's Eleven. Yeah. A little bit, uh, you know. And they thought about it, you know. They mm. didn't just go zap, oh, now we're in the cart and whatever. There's also like a really cool like shifting maze moment where there's a number of different creatures and there's slow down jelly acid and <laughs> and a little cameo, which we won't spoil until spoilers, I think. A cameo, Mason? Yeah. Oh, yeah, there is too. Mm. I forgot about that. Not of an actor. Oh, but there is a cameo. I'm talking about, I'm thinking about two. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, some character cameos and there's an actor cameo, which we'll, we'll talk about. Oh, there is too. I completely forgot. Um, well, speaking of cameos, Mason. Uh, before you do that, Thim- Thimbershoud, the wormsmith of Grax. Yep. Chew is the big fat dragon from okay. the Forgotten Realms. And what's his deal? He's fat. That's it? I think so. Great. Yep. Um, Auntie Donna in this. 
<laughs> Are true. they in just the Australian version or the international version? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Because mm. I recognise their voices. Yes. But some of the voices also, well, also they're actors. They're all actors. So I'm like, I think is this I think this one's Mark, but I, I don't know. <laughs> you yeah, know I mean? it was but, a little bit unclear, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. I, I think I think I recognise Zach. He has kind of a quite a long monologue, but the yeah, other two yes. are like, is that? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. But you're right because there's they speak to like five yeah uh, um, corpses mm. in in this grave. It's it's in it's in one of the trailers. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, who are the other guys? Just regular voice actors, or are they famous in another? Yeah. Are they famous American it's voice like actors? When or Rove uh, was a crab in the. Finding Nemo. Was he in every version of no, Finding Nemo? No, just our version. Was it? We got rogue. Betrayal. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah, yeah. okay. The movie was set in Australia. God damn it. That's right. Uh, yeah, but no, I think that scene with the, in the graveyard is like is one of the best scenes. Yeah. Like one of the funniest scenes. But I know, the, the reason, movie, and I um, you know, mentioned this before we watched it, I'm like, this is what I'm hoping for in this movie, yeah. which is the you know silly party back and forth and just yeah. it, it felt like real players playing around a table and – Attempting, attempting to, attempting to outsmart the dungeon master. Yeah, but they're not that smart. Yeah, it's, absolutely. and I thought that was a lot of fun. Exactly. You know, they're they're fallible characters. You know, in in, in various ways. They're yes. you know one one uh, takes everything literally. One is overconfident. You know, yep. et cetera, et cetera. You know, that's, one has a sword. One has a sword. Yeah, all the different characters. Yeah, yeah. One doesn't want. believe in himself. Absolutely. You know, um, and I think we can all relate to that. I agree. Spoilers. Yeah. Yes, best movie ever. Best Good movie fun. ever. I, think I hope it does well and we get a sequel. I don't know if it will. I would like it to. I think it it definitely could. Yeah. We'll talk about uh, the follow-ups in, in a moment, I guess. But, no, I would love to see more of this, you know, um, at least one more. And if they are going to do one more, they should do it quickly because people right. will forget. Yes, that's true. Because if you look at, like, to use the Chris Pine movie as an example, Star Trek 2009, mm-hmm. and then they waited, like, four years and then it was – into one. darkness and it was bad. Mm. So it's like it's either, this either has to be quicker or better. Yeah. You know, or both. <laughs> yeah. Ideally. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Uh, what's spo- that What's that three-point thing? You, if you, if you uh, ask for some Fast, good, good. cheap. Is that yes, the one? that's the one, yeah. Okay. Well, I want so this, fast and good and so cheap. This is, oh, okay, great. <laughs> You're saying we should hit all three points. Yeah, I'm saying we must hit all three points. Yeah. Yes, that's right. It might not be those three. It, it might, might have to be all those actors around a table just playing Dungeons and Dragons. We'll Absolutely. take it, I guess. But and they have to improv and be incredibly funny. And, and they're imagining they're in the real, real world and they've got office jobs. No, they have a podcast. And they're pretending they have a podcast, Mason. Nice. Yeah, there we go. Anyways, Bradley Cooper's in this. That's right. Things is wearing spoilers. Yeah. A little tiny Bradley Cooper, which I think was the only effect for me which didn't quite hold up in moments. Mm. But I think it's also because I'm used to seeing a regular-sized Bradley Cooper. Cooper, sure. And also probably because they had to sneak him into a closet. And, yeah, sure. And well, he's small, right? That's his real height in real very, life. That's right. <laughs> yeah. But he was kind of Hobbit-sized. and But not scaled like a Hobbit. Just a no. small man. A small, small, regular man. man. Yeah. I... I Look, first of all, I think they had to do it real fast. Yes. Because otherwise they would have probably altered the scaling or whatever. Yeah. And also my question is, why is he in this? <laughs> Does he know anybody? Does he, he, he likes a little comedy jaunt, doesn't he? That's true, but I mean like – I mean he's Rocket Raccoon. Why is he Rocket Raccoon? That's a great point. Yeah. I mean, does he does he like Dungeons and Dragons? I don't know. Does I've never does does he have a again? Does he have a, a mythical nephew who's like you should be in a Dungeons and Dragons movie? Maybe or, is he friends with Chris Pine or Michelle Rodriguez or like the directors? Yeah, maybe they must be. I don't know. I don't know either. Maybe he was just maybe he was just around the studio on the day, and they were like, "Do you want to?" Maybe they caught him in a rabbit trap. And they caught him in a rabbit well, trap. Why are you here? Right. Put him in a movie. That's right. Stop eating from our garden. Maybe they found him. And he had a he had a he had a, a little he had a, a little twig in his paw, and they <laughs> pulled it out. It was the size of a tree trunk for him. They pulled it out, and he's like, "Well, I owe you my life. I'll do anything." And they're like, "Well, be in this Dungeons and Dragons movie for maybe four minutes." <laughs> so the bit I was referring to earlier of that prison escape. They're talking. Oh, the other cameo. Oh, sorry, yeah. The other cameo is the um, Dungeons and Dragons adventuring party from the cartoon. Yes. The Dungeons and Dragons cartoon. They have the same clothes, don't yeah. they? And that's it. Oh, and there's sort of the, the custard carpet is sort of in this. Yes, that's right. Do you think that's a direct reference I to must the be. movie? I think it is, yeah. Yeah. The, if, if people haven't seen our video on the 2000 Dungeons yeah. and Dragons movie, one of the characters gets caught in a, a carpet made of custard, <laughs> and that makes a return in this movie. <laughs> So sort of. Yeah. Yeah, really good stuff, man. Mm. So yeah, there's a prison escape early on 
where they're, they're begging for release that he just wants to go and see his daughter again because he got captured because he was trying to get an amulet which would bring people back from the dead who's but it's his wife he wants to bring back from the dead. That's or right. And he, it's single use, and for some reason nobody has ever used that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Well, reason. you save it up, wouldn't you? You would save it up, yeah. yeah. How many are there in the universe? We don't know. One. Oh, also, yeah, so the, the premise is that he used to be part of the Harpers, which is a Forgotten Realms reference, yes. which are like kind of like adventuring spies, and they, but they but they work on, in the mm. force for good, but, you, of course, you don't get, really get paid that well. Yeah. And, uh, but, and, but he's, you know, on the side of good, and then he's in ASIO. He's a little. <laughs> are they on the side of good? <laughs> oh yeah, good point, Mason. Uh, but then, but then his um his uh, his wife gets very sick, and he's like, "Oh, how's this Forgotten Realms health insurance?" Don't know. And then she dies. But then he uh he turns to crime, and he raises his daughter, and she also likes a bit of crime. But a fun bit of just crime. Just a little bit of crime. Just though. a little bit of crime. But then just a splash. Yes, but then he, they they have a fun crime gang of fun adventurers, and then he uh. He he's out of the game. He is betrayed, and then and then he learn. He, they he, he, his friend Hugh Grant is like, "Hey, do you want to do you want to come on one last adventure? There'll be a little uh, resurrection uh, a totem thing, and you can use it to bring your wife back." And he's like, "I will do that." But then he gets caught, uh, and then he goes to prison with Michelle Rodriguez. <gasps> but then it's revealed later that actually Hugh Grant uh, wanted to get him caught deliberately or something, yeah, so he could. Rule, still a bunch of gold and whatever. That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And Hugh Grant has just a like being there. It's just like being Hugh Grant. That's right. That's what he wants in real life. Anyway, you were saying? Yeah, so they they mount a prison escape at the start and he, he pleads his case about why he's in there and they're at the top of this high they're tower. At a, they're at a bail hearing, yeah. And they're waiting for this particular uh, member of the committee to arrive because uh-huh. it's like I really want, you know, to plead the case to this particular guy. Uh-huh. Anyways, the guy who works in the walks in the room is some kind of bird man. He's a, a uh, he's an aracocra. Yeah. Which is a yeah, a big a big silly bird man. <laughs> and then it's revealed that their plan obviously was not to plead the case to the aracocra because he is so um noble and forgiving or, noble or they forg- know him even. That's right. But their plan instead is to just grab him and jump out the window and 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 hope that he will fly them to safety. <laughs> and then the reveal immediately is that the 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 bail, uh, the parole board was going to let him off anyway. <laughs> yeah, so right, yeah. It's very funny. <laughs> it's really funny. Yeah. And then the, Hugh Grant uh, attempts a similar thing mm. at the end, which, right. I, which I quite liked. But, yeah, they name him as an aracocra, don't they, before he comes in the That's room? right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I guess the other spoiler of this is that uh, Michelle Rodriguez dies and they bring her back using the amulet mm-hmm. because she gets poisoned by an un... You can't unpoison yourself if you get a particular red wizard That's right. thing. And they bring her back using the mag- magic amulet instead of um, the mother. Yes. Because the daughter is more... Uh, she knows Michelle Rodriguez as a, as a parental figure as opposed That's to her right. actual mo- mother, which makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I also and like... And there's, a, there's a, like a very heavy-handed like, I'm, I'm your wife in a dream and you've got to let me go. Yeah. <laughs> you better. You better. <laughs> and now I'm back right now at the pivotal moment. And I'm like, come on. Come on. Let me go. It's fine. Let me go. It's all right. Don't ever worry mm. about it. I liked that also they were just mates. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. just two mates and they were just... just just, you know, just doing some work. Right, you know? sure. Yeah. Looking after a kid, doing some little crimes and capers. Mm-hmm. I thought that was that was a really fun dynamic. I enjoyed the dynamic between Chris Pine and Michelle Rodriguez more than Vin Diesel and Michelle Rodriguez. Has Michelle Rodriguez done a lot of stuff that isn't kind of fast and furious action-based kind of sure she has. genre stuff? Has she ever been in a rom-com or anything? I don't know, actually. Mm. She could, though. She could. Yeah. I feel like she could be a, like a Star Wars kind of Cara Dune kind of Oh yeah, definitely as yeah. well. Uh-huh. Yeah, let me have a look. Mm. Forty-four years old. Okay, one point six five meters, pretty standard. Good, mm-hmm. good, good. Yep. Early life, uh, legal issues. Uh huh. Uh huh. What do we got here? She was in the Smurfs, The Lost Village. Okay. She was in uh, Fast and Furious Nine. Okay. She, the movie Avatar. She was oh in yeah. The movie Avatar. She was in Alita: Battle Angel. Yep. She was in Milton's Secret, which is a okay. family drama film. Mm. All right then. So there you go. That's terrific. She was in Machete Kills. That's a that's a funny movie, isn't it? <laughs> She's in the movie Inappropriate Comedy in 2013, which just looks like a that cannot be good. <laughs> no. And two of the oh, written... inappropriate comedy like yeah. an app. Okay, right. I'd never heard of this. No. Ari Schaefer, Rob Schneider. Oof, that's that's not no. <laughs> that's not good. <laughs> hey, I should have mentioned this in the movie Pixels. Yeah. I think that movie showed great restraint to not give the role of Cuba to Rob Schneider. That's a really good Or point. they did, and I didn't notice. Maybe. You know? Uh, yeah. It's yeah. a level of like, uh, yeah. you know? Yeah. 
you, you, in a lesser film, they would have done that. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> that is so true. But in the in the masterpiece that was Pixels, <laughs> they're like, no, no. They, were, they probably sat him down, like, we're sure you want, we're sure you understand, Rob, Mister <laughs> Schneider. We understand. Yeah, you can't be in this. Yeah, because you'd make it worse <laughs> somehow. Yeah. <laughs> Here's a bit that I loved also. Oh, yes. The, there's an evil red wizard who wants to bring back the undead and whatever and bad red wizards. Are they always bad red wizards? Seems so. Yeah. I mean, I thought you'd knew like outside of this. I'm pretty sure there are. Cool. They're, they're all bad. I, Great. I mean, maybe there's one outlier. Yeah. I mean, there's a good there's a good uh, dark elf. Exactly. Drizzt Doerden. Yeah. He's good, he but the rest a, of them are bad. Pulls a cat out of a fish or whatever. Is that the guy? What? No. Who's the guy... I'm in talking this, about this guy's not in the movie. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, who's the guy? Who pulls, what's he? The guy who pulls a cat out of a fish. He's a human man. Yeah, but he's from like a particular race of people or whatever and they're all evil and whatever, but he's not. Oh, yeah. I can't remember. And he's immortal maybe? Maybe. He's yeah. a paladin. Yeah. You're talking about Regé Jean Page. Exactly, yeah. Mm. Anyway, I liked the the bit at the end where they all just beat up the Red Wizard. Sure. I know I've said this before. It happens at the end of the first It movie. Uh-huh. Just like a bit where they're just like, let's And just... that lady is from the first It movie. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The... She was like, I insist on this as part of my contract. We all <laughs> get together and beat somebody up at the end. <laughs> you're, you're right. But, yeah, just the idea of like, you got the you got this coming and we're all going to use our different abilities to, to just beat you up for a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Love that. So they do want to make more of these apparently, but it's still very early days. Uh-huh. Uh, Paramount Plus, though, have already moved forward with an eight-episode spin-off series. The show is described as a flagship and cornerstone live-action series of the multiple projects in development, while the series will, com- will complement the film a side of the franchise. So presumably same universe and you huh. might get some character crossover and, okay. and whatever. And First so time hearing of this. I think we maybe talked about it. In February of last year, when they announced it or whatever, I see. Uh, yeah, and we also talked about how Dungeons and Dragons, like as a brand, is trying to expand, become more mainstream, and That's also true. wring more money out of oh, absolutely, yeah. and this is the way to do yeah. it by making something good. Nice, you know, yeah, yeah. But also, people have to pay for it every month. <laughs> yeah, that's so, right. It's pretty good. I mean, maybe it'll be like because the the movie ended with um, the sort of the the potential for a romance between Justice Smith's character. And the yep. lady from it, whose name I will get right now, and potentially, you know, maybe, yep. maybe, maybe there is Sophia the Lillis. There we go. Maybe this, maybe the series, you know, maybe a little, little bit of some rom com adventures with those two guys or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Good fun and and times and whatever. So she's like a weird shape shifting thing and whatever. She's but a tiefling. She's, but yes. she's born to like human parents, and they're like, a, is that right? So is, tieflings. So the the origin of so tieflings are like. Your ancestors made some deals with the devil. Oh no, that's bad. And so, may and so sometimes in that family line, like somebody's born with like demonic, okay, features and and attributes and so forth. That seems like a but good the, one. The, uh, the shape shifting is not from that. It's because she's a druid. Yeah, mm-hmm. which is exactly like a wizard. No, James, <laughs> we don't have time for this. There we go, Mason. Mm-hmm. Should we move it along then? Let's move it along. I think yeah. If you like. This, you should say it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you like it. Exactly. Do you like it? I do like it. I was thinking I think I think I could take my son to this. I know it's like an M rated here, but I don't think it's too. Nothing particularly gruesome happens, no, I don't think. It might be a little bit spooky in moments. Do you think your son would be. I'm just telling that movies aren't real. Do you, do you think your son would be um, disturbed by this, the bit where they all go into the big gelatinous cube? No. Okay, what if you told him that that's going to happen to him? <laughs> and there's one under your bed? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, my, I mean, probably the only don't. way out is if you turn into a snake, which I know for a fact you can't do. <laughs> Great point, Mason. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let, what's, it, what's it time for? It's time for what we're reading. Yep. What we're going to read. Yes. I'm doing the theme. What are we reading today? <laughs> what are you reading? Uh, I recently What are you going to read? I... <laughs> I recently discovered a YouTube channel uh, from uh, – it's called Justin Hawkins Rides Again. Okay. Justin Hawkins is the lead singer uh, of The Darkness, the band The Darkness. Oh, yeah, okay. And he's got a YouTube channel. It's been going for quite some time. Mm. Uh, and it's like just musings about the music industry and, and music in general and like music he likes and, okay. and, and you know, people, people – Videos about addiction and stuff like that, and it's just very interesting. He's a very compelling well, kind of guy. Well, he is, isn't he? Yeah. Some of the uh, some of the cl- the thumbnails are quite clickbaity. 
It's like, damn, can... Noel, you made me cry or whatever. Yeah. Or there's one that's like, you know, there'd be one that'd be like, how can anybody like Coldplay? Uh, and then he'll do a video about how like, well, of course you can like Coldplay because here's, here's how this song goes and how interesting it is and, you know, yes, all that sort of stuff. But absolutely. it's very interesting. And, you know, there's stuff about like, um, you know, Spotify and their, you know, their, their how how they pay or don't pay artists and like, you know, what happens if your song gets put in a movie or an ad or something like that? Yeah, and, there's, uh, there's one. Well, this this video is uh, the thumbnail says, well, this is embarrassing. And that's yeah. responding to my song being used in awful commercials. Yeah, right, right, right. I mean, just do its money. Who cares? Well, that's exactly it. But it's yeah, very interesting, I thought. Yeah. Yeah. Great stuff. That's all I've been watching, really. No, you seem there's busy. a lot of those. You There's... seem busy, though, Mason. Mm. Well, what I've been watching, and this is more of a plug. Oh, yeah. Uh, I played the Super Mario Brothers game, the original game. Oh, yes? Because I told you, mm. uh, apropos of nothing, yes. that um, I could beat the Super Mario Brothers original game. We have game. brain worms. It's not apropos of absolutely nothing. It's the you have internet brain worms. It's true, I do. Yeah. And so in doing, and so we're, there's a new uh, thing on Big Sandwich where we're going to do, uh, we're going to slot a Let's Play into rotation. Mm-hmm. And this one, it's a 37-ish minute video uh, of me attempting and doing, might I say, rather well at. Mm. Um, we won't, we won't reveal <laughs> doing Super Mario Super Brothers. Super Mario Brothers one. We won't reveal whether or not you broke the record. For for we won't reveal whether you completed Super Mario Brothers one as you claimed you could without practicing. Yes, and we won't reveal whether you beat the world's Super Mario Brothers completion time record without practicing as you claimed you would. <laughs> but we did that, yeah. So that's on BigSandwich.co. That's right. right. If you are interested, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. So if you got any games that we wanted that you want to do, um, the other and the other one that I have, I am locked into definitely doing is Batman Returns on the Atari Lynx. Okay, sure. So and that one I will practice, Mason. Wow. Because that is a devastatingly difficult game that I will complete. You said this before. I've ne- this one I've I never will seen do. any evidence of this. <laughs> yeah, I would like. So, like, as a, from an era perspective, I would say probably like eight sixteen bits. Yeah. Era something along those well, we, lines. We'll do whatever. We'll do anything. Really, yeah. yeah. If there's something particularly notable or, or relevant yeah. for the current or, or a thing that you'd like state. us to attempt or mm. whatever. Yeah. Nothing I have to like get running on my PC that's really like new and difficult to do, please. <laughs> Ideally in browser. <laughs> yeah. We can just record it on a laptop. Yeah, That'll I be... mean anything, you know, yeah. I, I, I can record anything. Yeah. But yeah. But let me whatever. tell you, as somebody who was not at the controls, I had a lot of fun. So <laughs> And so did I because I did an amazing job. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I've been doing. And, yeah. Mar- and we're going to Mario episode next week. Also, I said we we're going to do Batman Forever for mm-hmm. Caravan of Garbage, and we will. We've pushed it a week to squeeze in The Wizard next yes, week. That's right. So just so people know. Mm. But that is recorded. Uh, yeah. Anyways, Mason, what yeah. else are we doing? Oh, we're going to do letters. Let's do letters. I right love now. doing letters. The classic one was letters. This is the classic oh, one. Letters. We love you. Some letters. They're only a day away. Right now, we're gonna do that. You have a slightly pained expression on your face, but that's only because I know that you're going camping after this. <laughs> How did you know that's why I was doing the pained expression? I can tell. You got that thousand yard stare of a of an adult man who has to take his family camping in the rain. In the you don't know it's gonna rain. I told you it's going to rain, Mason. It, it is officially going to rain. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's bad for you. Fuck, that's some of the worst conditions to be camping. Camping's in. great. If but it's... you know what? The, the rain will be coming down on the tent and you'll be like, ooh, this is nice. But I'm in a tent. I'll set a fire in the tent, you could say, <laughs> in the nylon tent. I like camping when it's like hot mm-hmm. and like you're near the beach or whatever. Yeah, right. But I don't is know. Is it going to be hot near the beach? No, Mason. Interesting. It's going to be cold in a mountain. Inside of a mountain. Oh, no. Yeah. Anyways, I'm sure it'll be fun. The kids will, I'll pretend to have a great time for my kids. And then when they're old enough, I'll say, I fucking hated that. But I'm glad you had a good experience. You've saved it up. You put a little, <laughs> put a little, uh, put, a put little, a note in my put, phone. Yeah, that's right. I hated this. Let my kids know I hated this. <laughs> and you, you didn't leave no other context. So <laughs> 20 years, you look at this and you go, kids, I hated this. <laughs> <laughs> this whole situation, yeah, this I hate yeah. this. No, because I, I haven't been camping before, so I'm excited to actually take them because yeah. I, I think that, that part, mm. that's that's fun for them, I feel. Do all the camping stuff. Do the, right. the, the marshmallows and whatever. Yeah. Anyway, Mason, how do we reach the show? How, how do we how do others reach the show? At gmail.com yep. or you can uh, find us on Twitter and use the hashtag weeklyplanetpod and we'll find it somehow or James will find it. You know it. some sort of wizardry. Here's an email from H. Uh, who says, help my sanity by maybe discussing this. Okay. Hi, James and Mace. I love you guys in the podcast, but that's not the point right now. Oh. In the last couple of weeks, I've been seeing adverts for the mobile phone game Merge Mansion, featuring the world's hottest and currently most popular TV daddy, Pedro Pascal. 
Why is no one else talking about how weird this is? It's bizarre and I don't understand what's happening. He's done three of these adverts. If you're not aware, Merge Mansion has millions of downloads, but it's basically a matching things game. It has previously had a long history of short animated adverts with a serial soap opera-based storyline about a woman's romantic relationships and her murderous elder family member. The fact that this has now escalated into a live-action version of the story with Pedro being the detective is just unfathomable to me. However, no one I know has either seen the ads or feel this is odd enough for a brief entertaining discussion. I've never heard of this. Is it just this. me that finds this so bizarre? I have heard of this and it is strange. I am looking you're, at, you're this looking at it right There's now. so much information on this yeah. thing that I've never heard. It's everywhere. Oh, God, I'm going to be inundated with this because I Googled this one. That's right. I'm going to wipe this. I'm going to delete my browser. <laughs> <laughs> Far out. So, I mean, these make a lot of money. So they would have just been able to throw yeah, right? potentially tens of millions of dollars at this guy yeah. to promote and look, this. I think you... Oh, yeah, and so here's Merge Mansion. Yeah. It's just... So it's matching stuff. Uh, what's Grandma hiding? Renovate the mansion? Yep. Unlock hidden areas? Reveal? Reveal family secrets. Discover every item. James, you can discover a pot plant. <laughs> you can discover a little trowel thing. A trowel. Buy different types of buckets. Okay. It's pretty good. Merge hundreds of items. That's the merge part. Yeah. That, they've merged a basket and a hat there. Ba- well, a basket, <laughs> two, two baskets and two hats. Okay. A basket hat combo with another basket hat combo. And presumably you merge them, you get points or something. It's a mansion full of mysteries. Follow the story. Boy, there's a lot of thumbnails. Oh, Ma- Maddie says, oh, my, I think I put my hat in the oven and my cake in the hook. Got to go. In the hook. In the hook. I don't know if this has been badly translated or something. <laughs> I don't know what it is. But anyway, um, I th- look, I get it in the sense that you might be like, well, Pedro Pascal's and he's in two, two TV series and, uh, you know, that's yeah. he's, it doesn't he have enough money? I mean, maybe, but also both of those TV series, especially now, could disappear instantly. Exactly, yeah. As far as I know, The Mandalorian, not doing so well critically this season. So. No, not as much, yeah. I think it's going to build to something, but there's also they've taken their time to get to the thing that they need to be at. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, right. Yeah. Mm. But, you know, yeah. it's I've always thought – there's some there's good and bad. Yeah, right, right, right. You know? What I'm saying is like you buy a house in Hollywood. Yep. Uh, that's got a, that's expensive to maintain. Yep. And it's very likely that anything you're on, whether it be a movie franchise or a TV show or whatever, or could merge just, mansion, could go up in smoke. Now, merge mansion is the only <laughs> thing that could not disappear in a puff of smoke. You've got so many secrets to uncover. Yeah, it's more true. secrets than the Mandalorian. I bet. Can you kill the granny who's trying to murder you with doesn't a hammer? Doesn't say. Doesn't say. Can you merge her skull with the claw side of a hammer? I think probably. That's great. I gotta go. <laughs> I merged my grandma to death. <laughs> but money is the answer. The I money guess. is yeah, the answer. Yeah. And look, I don't. At the, at the, and you know, it's a probably a fun shooting day. You know, yeah, probably why not? It's 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 not the it's not like Pedro Pascal has been like. You know, I'm all about art, and I don't think money. I don't think art and commerce should ever yeah. cross over. And I actually think that. Well, would, I, I think that. I think yeah. that would actually be disgusting if I did that. And then he does a merge man. Yeah. he's never said anything to that no. effect. So why not do this why not? silly thing that exactly. they're going to pay him for? And download it. Download Merge Mansion. This is from T Ball Abel on Twitter. B A L T Ball. Hashtag Weekly Planet Pod. Sure. Hello, little James, regular-sized James and Mason's twin brother. With the announcement that Liv Tyler is returning as Betty Ross in New World Order, how likely is it this film is actually going to be Hulk's No Way Home? That's a great question. We didn't even talk about that. Um, there's, there's been some on-set photos of Harrison Ford this week as Thunderbolt Ross. Mustacheless. Mustacheless. But here's the thing, though. Oh, General Ross, when he – no, because when he becomes a Hulk, he loses the mustache. Are they doing the opposite? But I think when – General Ross became the Red Hulk. I think he shaved his mustache and put a fake mustache on so people wouldn't recognize him. Oh, okay. I think. Yeah. But I'm also wondering if it's also entirely possible that Harrison Ford has a fake mustache for this movie. Yeah. And he's and they've called cut and he's just he just whips it off and throws it on the ground. Get me another mustache. And then mustache. he then he storms across he storms across set to get his get in his little plane or whatever. Breaks his So leg. I don't think this is necessarily a a spoiler for the movie, but Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Thunderbolt Ross's only distinguishing feature is he's got a mustache and Harrison Ford does not have a mustache. And he's mad. But, yeah, this is, uh, this is interesting because so, – so thus far we have two, at least two, mm. Hulk uh, character alumni in yep. this new Captain America movie. So That's right. I mean, you know, people have always been saying, hey, more Hulk players, but obviously there's that 
contractual situation with Universal, which means they can't give them a solo film. So who knows what they're who up knows, to? Man, I think also apparently there was rumors this week that I think this was from Jeff Snyder that there's going to be like Adamantium's going to play a big part in it. Oh, that's right. Which yes, leads into the X Men and mm-hmm. et cetera and so that's forth. Right. But yeah, but where's his mustache? Great question. Yeah, do you have another Gmail? Here's an email from Megan. Mm-hmm. Uh, mates, boys, gents, why yawn so contagious? When going through your generous back catalogue of past episodes, on an episode 350 and 352, James does a big yawn, so I did a big yawn. I feel like I'm going to yawn now. And then he yawned four more times. I've always had this issue where yawns are incredibly contagious. Even as I type the word yawn, I'm literally yawning. Why are yawns contagious? Please send help for I'm so very tired. That's a great question. <laughs> Contag- uh, contagious yawning has been observed in humans in a growing number of social vertebrates. While the majority of studies on yawn uh, yawns have been documented, this phenomenon, uh, blah, 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 <laughs> there is no evidence. They don't know. Huh. They don't know, it seems. Wow. I thought we were going to solve this, honestly. I thought we were going to solve this with you doing a quick Google. Uh, they think it might be a result of a, so- a social mirroring. Oh. So, like, you know, you, you know, you know, when you meet somebody and you copy their exact body language That's and right. try and say exactly what they're going to say as they say it. And then you take over their life. Yeah. yeah absolutely. <laughs> it's yeah, just I know. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great yeah. question, though. Mm. I don't know. I wish I had all the answers. That's right. It's a social thing. Yeah. Isn't it about getting more oxygen or something? Uh, something that's going to perk you up because yeah. you're tired? Maybe. Yeah. Uh, it's from William Robinson, hashtag Weekly Planet Pod. Hey, hi, <laughs> James and May. So I was wondering if either of you had seen the comedy series Upright starring Tim Minchin and House of Dragons' Millie Alcock, uh, for, uh, who have a, a chance encounter and end up on a hilarious and heartwarming journey across Australia. It's a hidden gem. Thanks. I've seen the first season of Upright and I really enjoyed it. And I have yet to watch the second season, but no, I think uh, it's fun and it's got good music and it's got good feelings and hearts. I think I talked about it on Suggestible, my less successful but probably better podcast. Go on, Excuse Mason. me, what? I said probably better. What? Yeah. In what way? <laughs> Just it's better. It's more fun. What? More I fun? I like it more. I like my wife more than I like you. Oh, what? <laughs> wow. <laughs> but go on. Wow. I can't, you said- believe you, can't believe you like your wife more than you like me. <laughs> wow. But by a little or by a lot? Well, I don't know. I mean, if I had to measure it, it would probably be a lot. Like if I had to put like a huh. like a definitive amount, wow. it would be like it would be quite a wide expanse. But you would say that's probably Stockholm syndrome because you live with her and stuff. Yeah, I guess. But, you know, we've known each other for longer and yet I still think that. So I don't know what that says. Ah, <laughs> you yeah, know? yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Wow. Something to think about. Something for you to reflect on. I'm never going to think about it or reflect on it. <laughs> anyway, uh, have you seen Upright? No, I haven't, no. It's good. It's on okay. binge. I got one more email. Let's do it. Uh, James ruined my half marathon. This is from Joe. Thank you. I wasn't going to stoop to this, but then you said you <laughs> like your wife more than you like me. A guy you do a podcast with. <laughs> Hi, boys. Long-time listener of the pod from England. Hello. I used to listen to the pod whilst running as if there is one way to cure the boredom that is running around rural England. It's that. Mm, However, during the first England. attempt I had at a half marathon, I put on your best of uh, 2021, where it was going swimmingly well. I got to the last part of the run on a good pace and naturally the last part of the pod where I was greeted with a compilation of Westworld ringing through my ears not only was the body experiencing great pain, but now I was enduring a mental labyrinth of James repeating Westworld over and over. I couldn't switch from the pod as my phone was attached to my arms and it ended up calling it a mile early to end my suffering. Other than that, thanks for the laughs and can I be the official failed runner of the pod? Wait, a mile away? Yep. I'm sorry. Mm. <laughs> you could have walked it. It's very true. Oh, what I'm reading, what I'm going to read, I forgot. Uh, uh, I've been at the Melbourne International Comedy Festival. That's oh, why yeah, I've been. Yeah. That's why I've been so busy. You've been busy. Uh, and I've watched a bunch of people whose work I enjoyed. Let me tell you, uh, Beck Petratus, friend of the show. Oh my god, didn't has her first solo show. Glowing reviews, Mason. Uh, it's called Merry. It's about her worst Christmas ever, but it's a great mix of like like stand up and like like voiceovers and fun tech stuff, which is delightful. Okay. Friend of the show, Dave Warnicky, his show is – he's back doing stand-up. Which David Warnicky. Dave, David Warnicky, uh, he's back. I saw a um, uh, Grace Jarvis who's good at, very good at stand-up. Yeah. You might have seen her on Gamey, Gamey, Game. Absolutely. Very funny. You should see her. Uh, I saw a, a woman who I don't know called Christina Spitzica mm-hmm. who has a show called Risky Spizness, which is about all the – data she's saved up over her life like she's saved up like all her childhood like journals and all her icq logs and like all the just just every piece of data she's ever 
That's a, that's How a, did she find that? I don't, she's just got a big hard drive, apparently, and a bunch my of... My God. Uh, it's a, that's a funny show. Who else did I see? Uh, my friend Rose Bishop has a show called Feral, which is about her being feral. Very funny stand-up. Uh, Tommy Daslow has a great show. He's back. He's back. Uh, it's about a time he got... Uh, someone stole his identity and stole $10,000 from a bank. Oh, my God. Uh, so that's a good show. Uh, and that's all I've seen so far, I think. Great. Wouldn't want to be someone I saw who I've forgotten about. Well, you can always talk about them next week. That's true. I can. Anyway, everybody. Or we do an emergency podcast. That's right. If you're in Melbourne and you can see some shows, you should see some shows. Also, I met listener Liam, who works at one of the venues. He works at Campari House. Very good. And um, he said hi. To me? No. Ah. He specifically he didn't mention you at all, honestly. Yeah, but. Probably... I said, do you want to mention James? He was like, nah. But he knows who I am. I don't even know if he does. Mm. He did say who. I said, do you want, <laughs> do you want to mention James? He's like, who? <laughs> Wow. Okay. You might cop that. Uh, you, I did, cop I that, Mr. I'm best friends with my wife. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're so good. Also, uh, uh, we, I ruined that guy's half marathon. But to be fair, I didn't edit that together. That's the true. The Westworld compilation. That's, that's not uh, That's not my fault. Yep, you're so, right. So, you know. That's right. Yeah. You know what I find when I'm running or exercising and I'm listening to a podcast, I'm like, God, this is a real grind. And then I realize if I just switch to music, it's yeah. much easier. Yeah, I can't. But I also don't like I'd rather listen to a podcast running. I can only listen to a podcast, I think, when I'm walking. Okay, yeah. Or, or, or like sitting on a stoop. Sitting on a stoop or sitting on like a train or something like that. Or driving, I guess. But like mm. I can't I – can, like if I'm – sometimes I'm at work and I'm on standby. If yeah. They, if, they, if they need me to do something – but I can't listen. I can't read a book or listen to a podcast because I can't take any of it in because I'm like, what if they need me like now? You'll be so alerted. I'll yeah. be alerted. So I can listen to music, but I can't. Ah. Yeah. Anyway, funny how brains work. Funny, isn't it? Yeah. Sometimes you, you, you. Somebody's like. Sometimes it is, and sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it is, and sometimes it isn't. Sometimes your brain just doesn't work, and you're like, I'm bit with my wife. <laughs> my brain doesn't work properly. That's not a result of my brain blah, not working, blah, blah, Mason. Blah, blah, blah. I tell. I think any that. podcast is better than the Witcher <laughs> Better podcast. I'm sure I'm not the only one who thinks that though. As if, as if, um, James. <laughs> Obviously, this one is more successful. So in that respect, yeah, I like it more. Right. I like and in a way, it is better in that <laughs> sense. Yeah, Because that's the only – bat downloads is the only metric. Agreed. Yeah. All right. Is that the show? That's the whole show, folks. Thank you so much oh. for listening. We 100% appreciate it. Maybe 110% appreciate it. That's probably true. It. Maybe. Uh, folks, if you want to get into contact with us, you can go to weeklyplanetpod at gmail.com, at Facebook or Twitter at Bandcamp. You can go to the Planet Broadcasting Great Mates Facebook group. You can go to the Weekly Planet Podcast Discord and subreddit. <laughs> James is doing a vicious combo on all shadow our, boxing. He's doing a bit of a shadow box. Uh, uh, if you want to have some fun discussions about podcasts and pop culture, you can go to all of those places. Uh, if you want to uh, follow some people on the socials, firstly, follow our friend Rob Collings. He's at Raw Collings on Twitter. He's at The Weekly Planet on Twitter. He does all the socials. He does all the updates on this podcast. He edits the podcast. He does videos. He does all sorts of stuff. You should check out his stuff. He's also got a YouTube channel where you've got some, he's got some he Weekly does. Planet animations, which are terrific in my opinion. If you want to follow us, uh, I am at Wikipedia Brown on Twitter and Nick Mason on Instagram. James is Mr. Sunday Movies everywhere. If you want to support the show, you go to patreon.com slash Mr. Sunday Movies. Chuck them up. Or a man you would not miss. Or you can go to bigsandwich.co. Sign up for nine US dollars per month. Uh, you get bonus podcasts, movie commentaries, early videos, and ad-free podcast feed. Is that true? That is very true. I wouldn't lie to you. I don't believe you. Well. I guess you wouldn't know then. <laughs> it's true. Folks, uh, if you want to uh, buy some T-shirts, they're at tpublic.com. Just search for The Weekly Planet. Yep. And uh, thank you to The Brute and The Basilisk and Rackham for all our musical themes. Next week, we're going to talk about the Super Mario Brothers movie. Woo! But not the one from the 90s, the new uh, one. We already talked about that. Uh, we talked about it already. Also, you should review the show in-app. Ooh. Do you not want to do that, Mason? Oh, I forgot about you completely that completely skipped over it. <laughs> Whatever app you've got, you're using, you can do this. This is from Caffeinated Joe who says, always a top listen. My son got me listening to you a few years back ago, ago back, and now when an episode pops into the feed, it goes up to the top. Fun back and forth and takes on what's what's up in pop culture. Thank you so much, Caffeinated Joe. And this is from I, I can't believe I forgot message. to recommend the you deliver a review. No Unbelievable. One, no wonder this is still the best podcast, but... Not as much better than suggestible. I approve this message. It says, shows. Five stars, by the way. Love the show. I've been listening for years. Great take on movies and TV. Love to hear their opinions despite their high regard for The Last Jedi. Uh-oh. Ooh, Star Wars discourse. Still Let's get out of here before that kicks off. <laughs> That's right. Thanks, everybody, uh, and we'll see you next time. We'll have that, Jamie, guys. We'll see you real soon. Bye.